Introduction to NGS data. So in this in this uh, lecture, I'm going to be talking about uh, DNA and how we actually get this DNA into something we can physically analyze on our computers. Um, so I'll again recap the very basic fundamentals of DNA, the molecule, introduce what DNA sequencing is, and explain explicitly how Illumina NGS sequencing data is generated. The vast majority of ancient DNA data is generated by Illumina sequencing. Um, for a variety of reasons we'll, we'll cover later. So this is what we'll be focusing on, but many of the concepts again will apply to other sequencing technologies um, uh, in general. So firstly, what is DNA? You're probably all familiar, given you're already doing master PhDs on this, but to recap, DNA is a double helix uh, molecule which is stuffed into your cells and basically um, uh, encodes all information for, for life and grow and so on. When you sort of unwind this DNA double helix, my pointer again, a moment, you have um, sort of two outer strands, the thing that holds it together, and inside these two strands, which are made up of a sugar phosphate backbone, you have four different nucleotides, which are indicated here. And these four nucleotides are cytosine, thymine, guanine, and adenine. So the first two, cytosine and thy thymine, are the pyrimidines, and the purines are G and A, so guanine and adenine. Um, if I, I sometimes forget this, uh, how, you, how they bind together, as you can see here, they have these complementary pairs. And when you have a C and a G, so they always go together, think CGI, and if you have an A and T, you think an Atat Walker from, from Star Wars. The rule there is always one pyrimidine to one purine, and these always go together in the same way. Except this biology is a bit messy, but in most cases, they should go together like that. So always remember, if you have C on one strand, so one of the superphosphate backgrounds on the other strand, you will have a G and A on a T. And um, something's going to be fundamental for sequencing is that how we actually replicate this DNA. So how do you make another copy? Um, very, very basically, you unwind the DNA, you un unwind the helix, you separate the two strands. So the complementary pa uh, base pairs or the nucleotides are not bound to each other. And you basically have a polymerase that reads along this um, and basically pulls in free nucleotides floating around in, in the molecular soup pulls it into the pair and then repairs the sugar phosphate backbone. And this replication, like I said, this use of enzymes to put in these few nucleotides can be very fundamental to the way the sequencing works. How we get DNA, uh, you take your sample, you break up the cells, so the cell walls, you degrade all the other stuff that may block uh, sort of the, 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 the DNA, that may sort of may contaminate it. You then separate out, so you pull out the DNA, and when you're dealing with modern DNA, you not often get the what is essentially is very long bits of spaghetti, which is really nice and tasty. Clearly, that's what you're thinking when you're extracting DNA in the lab. DNA is a bit more different. It's conceptually the same. You need to break down the stuff that's holding the DNA in. You need to um, then separate it out from all the other molecular junk or the other stuff that's in there. However, ancient DNA molecules are not nice long spaghetti, which you like having your spaghetti bolognese. It's more like overly boiled, horrible, sludgy, broken up into tiny fragments. Um, and it's not just fragmented, not just very short, the DNA molecules, it's also damaged. So the ends of the I don't know, spaghetti are like really squished and smushed and so on. And on top of that, the problem with ancient DNA is we get a lot of modern DNA, the nice long, like good spaghetti on top of that. And so the challenge that we have to do is try and fish out these tall, small, tiny, crappy bits of spaghetti for whatever reason you want to eat that from all of this big, you know, nice spaghetti that you want to eat. Anyway, so that's changed with ancient DNA. And remember, very short, very damaged fragments. That will come uh, more important later on when we talk about Illumina sequencing. So what is sequencing itself? So sequencing is essentially converting the biochemical uh, molecules of a DNA molecule to a raw ACTG on your computer screen. So taking the molecule, converting it into something that you can read as a human on, on the computer, or even print it off as in the old days. And the way this works in most cases is along the lines of you go to replicate a strand, but then you're going to add modified nucleotides, so stuff we have modified in the lab, instead of just a normal natural nucleotide. 
And these are often um, modified in a way that they have a little thing attached to the end of the base called a fluorophore, which when you excite with energy, typically light, it'll emit light. And when you modify these, these four nucleotides, each different nucleotide will get a special color. So in, for example, yellow for A, green for G, no, sorry, blue for G, green for T, and C for red. And so the general concept is you add, when you're trying to make a copy of the strand, one of these modified nucleotides via the laser. I realize this may be now a millennial joke, which some people in the room may not understand anymore, but Peter's is nodding uh, knowingly with me. Fire the laser, the fluorophore will emit a light, and then you take a picture of the colors being emitted that, that one particular type, uh, time. Back in the olden days, probably when Tina was still learning all this stuff, <laughs> there was the sort of the first like really popular um, sequencing technique called Sanger sequencing. So this did revolutionize um, genetics at the time, genomics. This is, I think, the, the vast majority of the first human genome was sequenced with this, this method. Um, and the way this worked was the modified nucleotides that you had not only had a color, but it also blocked the addition of the next nucleotide going along when you're adding each nucleotide to the new strand. And so what they would do, you would take your DNA, you would add a primer on it, make lots and lots and lots of copies of this DNA, fragment it, no, sorry, that's wrong, uh, then don't fragment it. So it's one strand copied many, many times. And then you'd throw in lots of free natural biological nucleotides, let's call it, and then a little small handful of these modified nucleotides that have the fluorophore and the blocking uh, component. And because of biology, it's a bit random. The f some of the free nucleotides would be added onto the strands, and then eventually one of these modified nucleotides would be added. And this would range from just having immediately a binding onto your DNA molecule, uh, one of these nucleotides, the, the modified nucleotides, and in other cases, you maybe have 10, 20, 30 free nucleotides before getting the um, modified nucleotide. And what that meant was, once you've done this sort of um, uh, reaction, you would have lots of different molecules of different lengths, but all ending in one way or another with one of these modified nucleotides. They would then pass this, uh, this uh, aliquot of DNA, in, modified DNA, into a capillary gel, so basically drag the DNA through a gel, which meant that the, the smaller fragments, the shorter fragments would go further along, so go faster through the gel, and the longer ones would go slower. And by doing that, you could basically detect one at a time each molecule going through the capillary gel um, at each length, at each time point. When they do that, you'd fire a laser at it, and it would emit um, uh, the light, as we talked about the fluorophore, and what they would read is something like this as a chromatograph, where you can basically detect by the color being emitted at each given time point, which each given time point corresponding to um, a different length molecule, the light of the molecule of the nucleotide of that position. And with that way, you could basically reconstruct based on the light sequence out of um, the DNA molecule. The problem with Sanger sequencing is while it was very good, uh, because there's nothing better at the time, it was very slow, is very expensive, and very resource hungry. So you had to have a lot of DNA material to get enough of the copies to basically make the capillary gel to work. Um, and just it wasn't um, sufficient for genomics let, or genetics, let alone metagenomics, where we want to sequence not just one molecule or one genome, we want to sequence millions and hundreds of genomes. Then around 2004, 2005, a new technique called next generation sequencing came out. It is not next generation anymore. We're probably in the, the third or fourth uh, level of, of sequences, but people generally call this particular technique we're gonna talk about today, uh, NGS or next generation sequencing. The benefit of this is that you can see billions of DNA molecules at once. It's also very fast and very cheap compared to Sanger sequencing. Like I said, we're going to talk about Illumina sequencing today because that's what the vast majority of genomics basically uses, uh, at least in the short read sequences. There are others such as PacBio and Iron Torrent, but they, the accuracy was not as good. And Illumina essentially has a monopoly, almost a monopoly um, nowadays, particularly on short read sequencing. But like I said, now we have third, fourth generation stuff like Oxford Nanopore, which is changing the field because they specialize in long read stuff. But because we're working ancient DNA, which is very short, the crappy spaghetti, um, Illumina sequencing, the short read sequencing is perfect. 
And the way it works is actually quite similar to the Sanger sequencing with having fluorescent nucleotides um, emitting light. The difference is, is rather doing it for one molecule at a time, being part of the gel, we emit millions, hundreds of millions at any one point, as you can sort of see here. So every single dot on this, um, this video or GIF corresponds to one DNA molecule. And so by taking the pictures at any one point and using a coordinate system, we can actually track that at that particular point, which corresponds to one DNA molecule, as each nucleotide is added and you emit the light, we can record um, uh, the nucleotide being added and thus the sequence. And so what you're actually looking here is sort of a top-down view of what is called a uh, flow cell with a synthetic DNA lawn on it. So what this, and lawn is a pretty good representation of this. You can actually imagine this quite, quite well. So what this lawn is, is essentially you have a, a flow cell, which is pretty much just a glass slide, but this glass slide has embedded on it synthetic DNA nucleotides. So nucleotides, that again, have been made in the lab and bound to the top, to the top of this of this uh, glass. So on here, there's millions and millions and millions of short synthetic DNA molecules. And then we inject in your DNA sample, the DNA molecules get bound to these, or like complementarily bind to these uh, synthetic DNA molecules to we may basically spread across the entire flow cell and reconstruct a lawn like this. Again, just imagine these are bits of DNA molecules. And that is what you're seeing here from the top down view. But you might be wondering, okay, but how do you actually get your DNA to attach to this lawn or this synthetic DNA nucleotides? To do this, you have to convert your DNA extract into a library. Uh, converting into a library consists of adding adapters. So again, synthetic oleg oligos or synthetic DNA uh, sequences, which are basically complementary to the ones that are based on the bottom of this, sorry, are bound to the bottom of this flow cell. This um, adapter also has uh, essentially a priming site. This is where the enzyme polymerase can actually bind onto the, um, the DNA and start copying DNA. And also something that was developed which was quite useful for us as well is as a part of this adapter construct, you can also have indexes, uh, indices or indexes. These are again, a synthetic um, DNA sequence but we, that we use as a barcode. So one sample will receive one barcode, so one index. And this means that you can actually sequence many, many different DNA molecules at once. And then in silico, so on the computer after, separate out which DNA molecule comes from which sample. To go into a little bit more detail what this looks like, this is a, an example, Illumina DNA construct. So you have your actual template molecule here, your target molecule. So this can be your the DNA from your sample. And then at either ends, you can have you will have a the adapter and index primer. So this is the adapter. This is the thing that's complementary to the synthetic oligos on your flow cell. You have an index, is the sample specific barcode. The adapter also includes a primer for actually sequencing sequencing the index itself because you also have to index the barcode to actually sorry sequence the barcode to have that information to demorphize later on. Then you have the priming site for the polymerase for the target. So your template molecule. And then you have the same at the other end, which I'll explain a little bit more later on. Um, one problem, obviously, is that DNA molecules are absolutely minute. Uh, so the light emitted by a single flu flu fluorophore, which is even smaller than the DNA molecule, is going to be very, very, very small. So um, Illumina sequencing has a concept of clustering, which is a way of actually making the light emitted by a DNA molecule or a DNA sequence strong enough so the camera can actually pick it up. Uh, and the way this works is you have your glass slide. This is the flow cell in gray. You have the oligos on in green. So this is the, this is the lawn. When your DNA binds on, when you first in, inject your, your DNA into the flow cell, this will bind on to the, the sorry, well, the adapter will bind complementarily to the uh, synthetic oligo here. The DNA is then folded over into a, like a bridge-like shape. Uh, with a reaction, I don't actually remember off the top of my head now. It's a bridge amplification. Is the bridge amplification? No, but the, the bending over bit. Yeah, but that 
which is part of the purge. Okay. Yeah. So it binds to the other, the complement of the other in, um, adapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the actual concept. Anyway, whatever. Uh, so the once the the DNA is somehow bended over, the other adapter will bind to the other complement, so the opposite uh, oligo of the lawn. You then get a uh, a polymerase or a pri a, sorry priming site. Then with the polymerase, the complementary strand will be created again. So go. So you now have a single strand DNA to a double stranded DNA molecule. You then clip off the two ends. You then now will have two copies, but complementary strands of the DNA. So it's the same sequence, just one in forward and one in reverse. Then you do this again. So you bridge over again, you amplify, split it up, and you keep doing this repeatedly over and over and over again. And then you'll have lots and lots and lots of copies of the same molecule in one point on the flow cell. And so with that, when you fire a laser, while you're adding the, the, the modified nucleotides, they collectively will emit the same light in one go, and then basically you can take a picture, and it should be enough, bright enough now to take a picture of the, so to get the nucleotide core. So, again, this is essentially the same concept as Sanger sequencing, but the Illumina style. So, the process for incorporating the nucleotide, the fluorophore, and emitting the light is you have the DNA strand here. You have a priming site or primer that's bound already here. The enzyme will start reading through the, through the molecule and whatever is the free, whatever is the exposed base here will have a complement. So the polymerase will pick out the complement uh, free nucleotide floating around in the, in the reaction soup and it will bind there. So only that complement can bind there. You then wash away the free nucleotides so they're all gone now, and then you fire the laser, it'll hit the fluorophore, it'll excite it, emit the light, which is red. You then clip off, so this is the difference now with from Sanger sequencing, you then clip off the fluorophore, and then you repeat the same sequence again. So then you add the next nucleotide, in this case it would be a G. So it would be this green one. And then you do this repeatedly. So you add the free nucleotide, you wash away the, the ones that are not bound, you fire the laser, it emits the light, you then clip off the fluorophore and then add, add the next modified nucleotide over and over and over again. And typically in luminous sequencing, this can either happen maybe 50 times, 75 times, or 125 times, depending on which machine something you use, um, to basically reconstruct that, that read, that molecule. So this is another way of seeing it, but from the top-down view. So this is the sort of lateral view. This is the top-down view. This is more similar to what we saw with the, the, the pretty picture, the video earlier. The different points correspond to different DNA clusters, so after this bridge amplification. So these two points are two different DNA molecules. You add the first nucleotide, in this case both bind is a G. Then you clip off the fluorophore, you add the new next set of nucleotides. In this case, you have a blue light being emitted versus here. And the next one is a red and a green. And so every time you take the picture, you record at that particular point what color is being emitted, and you can reconstruct the sequence. So T, G, C, T, and you can see that by looking at the colors along here. And if you remember again the, the video from earlier, this is all happening millions and millions of times at once at any one point. So when you're capturing this picture, you're the hundreds of millions of dots, and each one corresponds to a different DNA cluster. There is, however, one caveat to this four color thing, which is two color chemistry. So some Illumina sequences take a slightly different approach, where rather than having four independent colors, it only has two colors, which is red and green. And the green corresponds to a T, C corresponds to red. And if both, so the fluorophore is modified to emit both red and green wavelengths at the same time, that corresponds to an A. And if there is no light emitted, that is a G. So no detected uh, dye. So depending on whether you're using for example, HiSeq and MySeq sequences, that is typically four, uh, four channel. If you're using NextSeq and NovaSeq, that is typically two channel, two color. And you have to do slightly different processing based on that, that um, uh, sequencing platform. And then the last main concept that we have to consider here is improving quality. So over time, so as you're going through the 125 cycles, um, the imaging reagents will start getting a bit tired, uh, you know, less optimal, they're not working, and so more errors will then occur. So sometimes bases won't, won't uh, bind correctly, sometimes the wrong nucleotide will bound. 
And there is no repair mechanism in this way to sort of fix these. And so over time, the clusters, so all of the copies of that one molecule will start getting desynced. So some will be emitting the correct G, but a few may be emitting the A. So the colors will not be clear. And so the machine does try to estimate the, the probability that this made the right call um, by looking at the different wavelengths being emitted. Um, and it generates a base quality. So if you have a dead base call, so the machine has no idea what it is, it will call an N. Um, and in the early days, this happened quite a lot when the accuracy wasn't so great. And so Illumina came up with a way to correct for these sort of low quality base calls, which is paired end sequencing. Um, and the way this works is you'd firstly sequence in one direction, which you can see here. So you bind your polymerase with the primer. The polymerase reads through the DNA insert. It makes all of the, um, the, the base calls, but over time, as it gets closer to the, to the lawn, it starts getting tired, mistakes are happening, and so on. So what they do then is basically flush out all the reagents. You then, using the bridge, essentially a bridge, uh, bridge, uh, bridging concept, flip the DNA molecule over, and then read it in the reverse direction, but with fresh reagents. So what that means is that the reaction at the other end will now be much higher quality. You have less errors and mistakes. And then when you get to the actual um, by formatting analysis, you can overlap these DNA molecules in some cases, particularly for HDA, which is very short. Take an average or you know correct for um, low quality bases by looking at the base core of the other end of the molecule uh, of the of the other strand. And so with this paired end sequencing, you actually get um, improved like higher confidence in your base calls. But also, if your DNA molecule is too long, so actually it is longer than the base cycles that you have, by reading the other end, you can get the other end of the molecule. So you can actually get longer DNA sequences um, uh, um, to basically yeah, reconstruct more of the DNA molecule, which becomes more interesting and more important later on, as we will learn on day four about de novo assembly. OK, so the machine has now taken lots and lots and lots of colors, uh, pictures, and it is somehow converted this now to A, C, T, and G based on the order of those, those, of those colors. But when you're de doing bioinformatics, you're not actually dealing with colors, you are dealing with sequences, so A, C, T, and G, so the actual letters. So how do you do this? So the first thing is demultiplexing. So if you have added these special um, sample-specific barcodes or indices, um, you need to separate these out. So you know that this molecule comes from this sample and this molecule comes from this sample. And we do the, 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 in many cases, the machine, but also there are tools that do this immediately after called demultiplexing. In the vast majority of cases, you yourself will not do demultiplexing yourself. That is normally done by the sequencing center or your sequencer technicians. Um, but the concept is essentially the machine will then read uh, the, or the, the computer will read the end of the molecules, read these indices, the adapters before they're removed and say, well, OK, this has the barcode of this, so I'm going to put all of these molecules with these barcode into this file. Uh, sample 2 has this index, so it's going to group all of these into here, into that file, all these in that way. And so demultiplexing is just assign, taking the clusters based on the indices into separate files. And these files are called FASTQ files, which Wikipedia has a, quite a nice description of this. It's a text-based format for storing both biological sequence and the quality information um, associated with each base core. And this base quality score is um, encoded in an ASCII, uh, uh, ASCII scale. So this is what it looks like without the colors. Um, the, the example of two, two DNA sequencing reads. These files can be gigabytes in size or terabytes in some cases. Um, and what it consists are is a repeat, a repeat, repeating four lines, a sequencing ID. So this corresponds to the read ID or the machine ID, the platform ID, the location, the coordinates on the flow cell, and maybe also the, the adapters, the indices of that particular molecule. You then have the actual DNA sequence itself. So C, A, C, D, and G. And you can see here the very beginning um, base call is an N, which in call suggests that it had a, a very bad call, so the, the color wasn't clear. What it was. You then have a separator. Never really sure why there is a separator, but there is, which is a plus. And then finally, you have the base quality scores. And this is what it corresponds to here. This uh, gradient or range can vary slightly depending on which machine you're working on. 
but generally it looks something like this, where if you have a bad base quality score, like an N here, that is encoded in a hash. So it's being, it has been called as an N because it has a hash base quality score, because the confidence that the machine picked the right nucleotide is very, very low. Whereas the rest of the molecule, J, is all the way up here at 41. So you can see J41. And over here, really high quality scores here. And that is sort of your, your main file that you're working on um, from sequencing onwards. And this is what you normally receive from your sequencing center or sequencing core. So to very briefly recap, DNA molecules are essentially made of four nucleotides, A, C, T, and G. You have two strands, which have complementary base pairs, C and G and A, T, so CGI and Atat Walker, Star Wars. Modern DNA is long, ancient DNA is short. But because it's very short, this is perfect for, ancient, uh, for NGS sequencing because you have these limited number of cycles. Uh, NGS sequencing has a benefit is massively multiplex. You can see, uh, sequence millions of DNA molecules at once. And it does this by having adapters. You bind to the end of your molecules. These can bind to a flow cell, also called the lawn on the glass slide. You then basically reconstruct, uh, and you bind this as a single strand. You then bind on, uh, or actually add or incorporate the new modified nucleotides to this, uh, the complementary strand, adding the fluorescent nucleotides um, as you go. You fire the laser at each one, take a photo, remove the fluorophore, and repeat. And because of this desyncing of clusters, um, you get lower base quality scores, and then you can improve this in some cases by doing paired end sequencing. Um, and I'll answer the questions at the end. I just saw there's a question in the chat. Sorry about that, but I'll come to that at the end. So some considerations for ancient metagenomics. There are going to be a few artifacts and things you have to think about when you're taking NGS sequencing data to your, to your own um, metagenomic applications. Um, one is low DNA preservation, and the artifact from this is the risk of PCR duplicates. When your DNA sample does not have that much um, DNA in it, when you're going through the library preparation uh, steps, you often have to do lots of amplifications to get sufficient DNA to actually sequence it. When you haven't got very many DNA template molecules in your sample or your library, and you do the amplification, you risk of getting lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of exactly the same molecule. This provides no additional information for you whatsoever. This is problematic in ancient metagenomics because in uh, inflate taxonomic ID counts once you do taxonomic, taxonomic classification of the DNA molecules. And it also reduces the number of sequenced reads because your duplicates, when you're over amplified, will compete with the true DNA template molecules, which give you unique information. Um, yeah, so basically they'll compete with each other and the duplicates, because there's just so many more copies, you're more likely to sequence this. And this can result, to, result in ugly things such as this, where all of these green blocks, as you can see here, are duplicates. That is not going to give you any more information and you want to get rid of this, either in the lab or in silico. But generally, if you have a high duplication rate, that is a bad sign that potentially you either have a bad sample or there's something's gone wrong in the lab in terms of the amplifications. Another issue, which is not ancient metagenomics specific, but has become more prominent recently with the more recent um, Illumina sequences, is index hopping. This is where during the um, multiplexing, so sort of mixing of the DNA molecules before you achieve the sequencing, this I think happens in the machine itself or in the library prep machine. Anyway. Um, where you accidentally have not cleaned up your library sufficiently. So there are still free index primers or adapters in your, in your library. And these somehow accidentally bind or complementary bind to the wrong uh, index complement when you're doing the amplification for sequencing. And what this means is that when you have the wrong adapter, so this free net adapter here, gets bind to your uh, sample, you then make a copy of the DNA molecule, but with, then with the wrong adapter at the other, other end. And this can cause problems that later on, when you're doing DNA multiplexing, you start incorporating actually DNA molecules from the from the wrong, or rather, the the barcode associated with the DNA molecule is from the wrong sample. And this can be problematic when, in particular, you're mixing shotgun and target capture enriched libraries, where you may, let's say, have a shotgun human genome, uh, which you're doing screening for, and then you are also sequencing at the same time a this target enriched, so you've done lots of amplification or capture enrichment of a particular pathogen. And you may start seeing in the shotgun genome pathogen hits. That's a Yersinia pestis black death. Um, 
in your shotgun sample. And actually, that's not the case that that sample is negative, but it now looks like they is a positive. But this can happen in some cases with index popping. It typically happens at very low levels on most sequences, but the new sequences, such as the HiSeq X and NovaSeq, which have a special type of flow cell, it happens a bit more often. So it's something to also check for um, or consider when you're doing your sequencing. Um, another thing that we have talked about is sequencing errors. So even though you can, for example, do paired end merging in the sequencer to improve your base quality scores, that is not always the case, that it will help. Um, you have to be a little bit aware of this. If you have a lot of very low base quality scores, uh, this is an image you'll see later on in the, in the workshop. But if you give, consider this is the beginning of the molecule, the beginning of the sequencing cycles, and this is the end, the base quality scores are dropped down rapidly. The more of these low quality base cores you have, the more increased risk you have of fake mutations or false positive mutations incorporated into DNA molecule, which can cause a range of problems. So this can result in the wrong assignment of that region taxonomic profiling. So it aligns against the wrong genome. It reduces the chance of the molecules overlapping uh, during de novo assembly. And also when you're doing variant calling for let's say phylogenetics, um, if you have low coverage, it may risk the case of, incorpor again, incorporating these fake mutations and, again, putting your genome in the wrong place in the tree. Another fun one, which in Mentionomics we tackle very regularly, which is really annoying, is CARP. You will find, very likely, CARP in every single one of your samples that you come across. If you do, for example, um, taxonomic screening against the NCBI nucleotide anti database. The reason why is dirty genomes. Um, unfortunately, as much as there is a lot of quality control that goes into the genomes published on NCBI and ENA, um, often they are not assembled very well, and they get uh, they have lab artifacts integrated into the into the genome. For example, famously, the CARP genome is just full of Illumina sequencing adapters. So anytime you have a little bit of a sequencing adapters left in your sequencing in your library, they will align to the CARP genome. And look, everyone has CARP. Um, and the ridiculous thing is that these genomes do not necessarily get removed from these databases. Um, even back in 2021, this was still there, which is really depressing. And so this is something also to be considered that if you don't sufficiently quality control your sequencing for adaptive removal and you re re recreate genomes and stuff, you may start getting false positives, you may add adapters into your genome, and that can be problematic. When it comes to jump back very briefly to the two-color chemistry sequencing, is you have the issue of low sequence uh, diversity reads and also polygy tails. Polygy tails are particularly common in the um, uh, two-color chemistry uh, sequences when you have very short molecules. So if you consider that the absence of light being emitted in a two-color chemistry machine like NexSeq, like NovaSeq, means that you get a G, if you have nothing more to sequence, you'll have lots of empty uh, uh, colors, but nothing being emitted, and so you have long, very long tails of Gs being called. In ancient DNA, we have short reads, so very often we sequence through the entire molecule, let's say 50 base pairs, before you get to the full 125 base pairs of the sequencing cycle. This is a problem because these very long uh, mononucleotide regions can actually align to um, many eukaryotic genomes in particular, which could be a false positive because the G is an artifact, a lab artifact. Also, it can result in unspecific alignment. It can actually align against many different eukaryotic genomes. So it pushes in taxonomic classification um, your, your confidence of the species-specific assignment to basically null. And also, if you have a pure poly-G uh, DNA nucleotide uh, read, that means it will assign to, align to everywhere and gives you no information whatsoever, which is a bit of a waste of time in actually trying to taxonomic assign it in the first place. And also, we can inflate counts at higher nodes in your LTA. That's something you'll learn again later on, but it's not good to have them. So you either want to clip off these Gs, ideally, if they're at the end of molecules, um, or do four-color chemistry, sequence of chemistry. That's not always the case. So something to be aware of, to either clip them off or remove these reads before you do taxonomic assignment. Um, so to recap the sort of more bioinformatic ends of these things, things to check for when you're getting your raw sequencing data. Check for the duplication rate. Do you have PCR duplicates? That may consider either, that may uh, um, suggest you have a low preservation or you have, there's a problem with lab um, construction or library construction where you amplified too much. Consider index hopping. You start seeing sort of, let's say, pathogens, for example, where you're not expecting to see pathogens. Sequencing error, 
low, so particularly if a lot, the bar, large bulk of the, much of your reads are have low base quality uh, scores, then that's something to consider. Um, adapters, really make sure to remove your adapters. Please don't become the next famous carp genome. And also low sequence diversity reads can be problematic in some cases if you have them. So that's something to also consider. Um, 